you're ready to try an extreme sport here? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, was I adapt offer, to the I was local culture. Offer pace with you. Yes. You're welcome to. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, so I'm going to just start the conversation, but open it up pretty quickly. Um, lots of interested people here with lots of questions. And I'm going to ask Stephanie if you could just give me the high sign when we're five, ten minutes out. That would be um, great. So, um, so let's talk about journalism. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about, uh, that I've been thinking about with this whole journey and was thinking about as you were talking was, um, and for those of you who didn't see on the uh, Neiman Lab today, um, Justin's great story about what Paul will have in his backpack, um, which we can get into um, later, but you'll have technology and you'll have the ability to um, access people, lots of news and information. You'll have a view of the world that lots of people near you and around you um, won't have. And you'll also, you'll need to access that information in part for logistical reasons. Can I cross this border? What's going on in this part um, of my trip? But I'm, I've been thinking about how um, the way you work and some of the objectives of this project require a certain sort of uh, news naivete. Mm -hmm. Um, to be in a space and in a moment independent of what is going on mm -hmm. uh, of the world. And how are you going to, how's that going to work for you? How are you going to think about what you need to know that's not in the moment in these spaces that Sandy Close, who we were with just before coming here, talked about the silent spaces mm -hmm. in the world? No, absolutely. I think this is a, a project about how do you translate narrative silences online and I've been speaking with my friends at MIT about how to do that and how to use uh, hyperactive media like social media to to maybe even in a guerrilla fashion subversively use that to convey a notion of waiting a notion of expectancy for a surprise to come down the pike but I've thought too about this notion of how much do I be a foreign correspondent as opposed to a walking storyteller. They, they, they overlap a lot, but there are extremes on each end. And the honest answer is I don't know. I think it will evolve, and I think it will change depending on the human topography that I go through. I can imagine going up the Rift Valley where day after day, the story is going to be living and moving with two or three uh, people pushing animals across the surface of the earth. And will I want to get on the satellite phone, because today you can carry, I should have brought it, it's in my hotel room. It's a small, it's like a tablet-sized instrument that weighs less than three pounds, and you could get high enough uh, connections through the satellite running off a battery that you can actually have streaming video, you can get on the web and research anything that I could sitting in an office here in Cambridge. How much do I want to expose myself to that? I think I'll probably base it on my past experience and then see where it goes from there. When I was researching uh, Tihun's story, for example, I didn't see any news f for a couple weeks. I didn't need to because the story was hers and the world was hers. And for me to introduce the world um, while I was in it with her would have been distracting. Nonetheless, I had to use the world's information once I wrote the story. Um, I included interviews with, with human rights workers, with, with uh, people who are monitoring child marriage and its effects on young girls. So. I too am going to be interested to see, I think it'll be like a heartbeat. My, my physical horizon, my tactile horizon, my sensory horizon will expand and contract as I move across the world, depending on what stories I'm writing, which has sort of always been the case, but now even more so. Um, will walking enforce that naivete even more to an artificial degree? I don't think so, because I think when I start feeling like I need outside input, I'll get on the satellite uh, and open it up on, and uh, get information. Your um, work uh, has long required a certain sort of anonymity. You go places where other people are not. Uh, and one of the things I'm concerned about with this trip, and I know you've thought about, is the potential for spectacle. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you mentioned in your opening comments, you know, we talk about a global 
world, we talk about interconnectivity, who knows what that really means. But one thing it does mean is that news about you and this trip um, travel. How, how are you going to fend that off uh, and make sure that it's not you know, encroaching on the, on the work? That's, a, that's another um, process of, of evolution uh, that I can't, I can take measures to attempt to control it. Um, but as my friends here at Harvard at the Center for Geographical uh, Analysis have pointed out, I will not be able to control anybody who comes up to me, snaps a picture of me on their phone, and it's, it's geocoded. I mean, it'll, they'll be able to locate me in a second. I can't control that, and at a certain, I thought naively at a certain point that I could, but I think I have to sort of cede that control because otherwise it just becomes a, a counter spectacle. It becomes kind of a, an artificial hermetism. So I hope that by taking some basic measures like having a time delay on the journalism, I can't control people taking pictures of me or interacting and then posting it on their blogs in real time, but at least in the journalism, the fallback um, measure has been to have a time delay on all the journalism by about a week. Um, so unless there's a, a breaking story where I need to, need to telegraph to readers and viewers that it's happening in real time, the majority of the journalism will appear about a week later. What does that do? That adds a little blur to my precise location. My, my location will show up precisely, but about 100, 120 kilometers after I've walked past that point. Um, at National Geographic, we had a discussion about, do I put my picture up on the web, or do we do a sketch? Um, I think the decision is gone that there, there are enough pictures on me, of me on the web that if somebody really wants to find me, they can just go onto Google and, and find me. Um, the, the bottom line is this. If it turns into a circus, if, if mayors of small towns start meeting me at the outskirts with the city key, uh, if I start getting offers of free stays in, in hotels, uh, if, if people start meeting me, uh, if there becomes a drive to have a Paul Salopec raffle to have people come along, I think that basically warps my method so much um, that I would not be able to continue walking, frankly. Now that might change. You know, let's have a conversation a year from now. Maybe I'll be selling raffle tickets, <laughs> but you know, I'll say carry my pack. Um, but right now, I think it's 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 a very a very it's one of the big sources of concern for me, and I, and I, I guess I can't control it. I can't get too popular. I can't get to be too much of a phenomenon. But blessedly, blessedly, there's so much going on in the, in the world today, especially the digital world, that I think I'm not going to have to worry too much about that. I think I'm going to be obliterated by breaking news. I'm going to go off radar. And then people will see me again when the stories reappear. Again, by surprise. I love that notion of, of, of tantalizing people, making the wait. I want to attenuate attention spans. And this is the only way I know how to do it. You, um, you talked about the questions that kids have been asking you, and I love this whole education component of the trip. One of the questions that they've been asking you a lot about is safety. Mm -hmm. um, the world to lots of kids is a dangerous place. Um, the world to you, I know, is not. Uh, you see the world in a very different way, despite the fact that, as you referenced, you have an assignment. Um, been imprisoned and that there are dangers out there. But from a kind of logistical and journalistic perspective, how are you thinking about that? How are you thinking about safety, knowing when you can go someplace, knowing when you can't, and what sorts of, this is a room full of journalists who worry a lot about logistics on um, foreign assignments. What's the, what's the mechanism for keeping you safe? You know, I, I, in my experience, uh, the times when I've gotten into trouble, not exclusively because there's just bad luck when the fates are against you, but the times when I look backwards when I've been in trouble is when I've been in a hurry. It's when I've been rushing into a story, when I think I have the, the goods and I don't, when I've been driving by the people beside the side of the road in the village who are trying to wave me down saying, don't go that way, and I'm on deadline, that's when I get into trouble. I think counterintuitively, though I will be very vulnerable on foot, there's no question. Um, there's nothing more vulnerable than a person on foot in today's motorized world. I think one of the cool things that I'll be testing out, and I feel good about it in my gut from personal experience, is that when you move slowly through a story, when I was going by canoe through the Congo, 
I was moving slowly enough that people could accost me or have a conversation or, or signal or, or mention as an aside over a cup of chai that there might be something a little bit awry over that mountain, which I would have missed had I driven by it in a Land Rover, certainly had I flown over it. So in, a, in, a, in an odd way, by moving through the human information ecosystem, word of mouth is a form of protection. It's a form of, of knowing a prevention, of like defensive walking, as it were, knowing what's ahead the way I wouldn't if I were rushing like a madman to get to some place. Um, that doesn't downplay the dangers. I'm setting up a system of fallbacks where I have uh, people who've been experienced advise me um, uh, from regions of the world that I'm walking through. Veteran journalists will be advising me uh, about where to go and not to go if I have a decision to make. Um, so, yeah, I think the, the, the point that you raised at the beginning, Anne-Marie, is an interesting one. There have been a lot of questions from American kids in particular, just circling back, to this notion of the world as being a dangerous place. And there's no question that the world is dangerous. It can, it can kill you in an instant. Um, and I've certainly covered enough uh, dicey parts of the world conflicts to know that your odds are even of coming out of some places. But what strikes me, even in the most dangerous places, is that by and large, the default mode, even in a war zone, and it's, it's gonna sound odd to people who haven't been there, especially soldiers, because I'm not a soldier, I'm a civilian, is the open hand. Even from a man who's pointing a gun at you, if you can make eye contact, not for too long, but if you can make momentary eye contact keep your hands in a certain attitude, move at a certain sort of, I don't know, it's, I don't even know how to describe it. Move slowly, but not too slowly. You signal non-threatening attitudes. Hospitality around most of the world, including especially the hardest corners of the world, is the default mode. People will take you in. And what I've told American audiences, what I've told young kids before, is that if you, by some transportation device get teleported into the middle of a jungle that you've never been, into a culture that you've never been to, a language you've never heard, there will be somebody within walking distance who will take you in, feed you, clothe you, and make you safe. I'm going to ask one more thing and then open it up. Um, knowing all the technology in your backpack, what, um, what's to read? Hmm. That's, that's the beauty of the technology, it's because I'll be able to download books. Right, but what 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 do you t what what's going to be on your Kindle or iPad when you oh, set gosh. out? Oh gosh, um, there'll be there'll be the obvious uh, repertorial books about the, the the human and physical landscapes I'm walking through, but there'll be books that I'll be rereading also. I mean, everything from the earliest quest literature going back to classical re Greek poems to to Basho, the walking poet. Um, to novels, I mean, I, I would, I would, the list is long, and, I, and, and I'm using, I'm gonna be using that literary succor probably more than I ever have in my career because of modern technology. The beauty of having it on a, on a small instrument, I have the libraries of the world at my fingertips. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of reading. Alex, on oh, Jen, <laughs> Alex or Jen. what or whom you've been reading to prepare for your journey? And a second question, which is, what are you gonna be doing about languages as mm -hmm. you're traveling? Are you gonna have fixers? How, how is that gonna work? Yeah. Um, the books that I've been reading, um, alas, so far, Jan, are repertorial books, because I have so much prep to do. The first year has two possible routes um, that involve multiple countries. So I'm finding, because of the uncertainty, that serendipity in this project is, is intrinsic to its success, but it also puts a really big onus on me as a reporter, because I'm not doing point source reporting anymore. I have to report the places in between pre-report. So I'm doing a lot of research reporting. So a ton of, 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 of books about you know, famine, uh, the causes of famine, basis of climate change leading to famine. I have, I have 
books on animal husbandry involving camels. Evolve, I mean, it just it gets as granular as you want. But um, the the second part of your question, which I've already slipped my mind, which was languages. Excuse me. Uh, it's another beauty, I think. We'll see if it proves out of the walk. In that, I was never really required to learn the local languages that I was reporting through because I was always reporting through them quickly. And I would hire what we call a fixer in our business. It's a, generally a local colleague who's far better than we are and often in many cases and gets none of the glory, um, who, who arrange things for us, including translators, interpreters. I will have people walk with me. The whole idea is that this is an accompanied journey. Uh, it's not a, uh, an extreme sport. It's not a, sur uh, a very long Survivor Man episode. Uh, I, I'll be moving through nature. I, I love nature. But I got all of that sort of extreme sport inclination out of my system in my 20s. And I'm more interested now in sort of extreme storytelling, if you will, which is, again, by our current definition, which is totally warped, actually spending time and inhabiting stories. That means inhabiting languages. I'm looking forward to moving slowly enough to the Middle East so I can finally learn Arabic properly, instead of the 300-word vocabulary that all foreign correspondents, except the really good ones, uh, pick up. Um, I look forward to learning the lingua francas, uh, you know, the Turkic languages as I move through uh, Central Asia. Um, of course, flat, I don't know about Chinese. <laughs> Even 14 months, I'm going to try. But I'll be moving with people, I'll be, walking, I'll be moving with walking fixers. Uh, who will be my translators and hopefully pick up languages more fluently than I ever have before. And of course, the, the new world, I'm, I'm set. I speak both languages. Yes, uh, Stephanie Schroen with the Gazette. I was curious about how, when you report out, how you will make that reporting stand out, out if you will. In other words, the, the web is non-hierarchical. Mm -hmm. In other words, the person who goes on a trip and posts pictures of how I spent my summer vacation can be almost on the same level as, as your work. Um, and there are a lot of people who do go around the world and post a lot of things. How will you signal that this is something a little bit more than that, or are mm -hmm. you just going to take your chances and be among the throng and hope you stand yeah. out? I think it's a two-pronged answer. I have the great, great, great good fortune of having media partners such as National Geographic who will help me foreground the work and help me present it before um, other writers and storytellers who might be better than I am but don't have that kind of backing. So thank heavens for National Geographic to be able to invest as much energy and enthusiasm into this as they have. And then the other thing is I hope that um, I understand what you're saying about the tidal wave of, of information washing out uh, a sense of, of differentials in quality, however you want to define that. But I would hope, I would, here's the thing that geographic, put fingers in your ears. I would be happy for a small, loyal audience as opposed who will see me through, through months and maybe even years of the walk, and I include school children. Imagine growing up with the walk, pretty cool. Rather than a large, massive, dispersed audience whose attention I will never truly get. I, you know, maybe I'll appeal to both, that I, I welcome them all, but the ones who have me truly excited are the ones who are excited about storytelling. Uh, in whatever form it will take, whether it's long form or these small mosaic shards that I'll be composing across the world. Just one follow-up. Would there be much interaction? Would, would there be any act, re, interaction back and forth? In other words, if these people go on your journey, will you be responding back and forth to them? Yes, I will. I will, to, to up to a point that the technology and, more importantly, the story permits. I'm going to be testing those boundaries. And as some of my partners uh, who've been advising me on social media I mean, I was speaking with Ethan Zuckerman on a phone the other day, and he was saying, Paul, you know, it'd be fascinating to see how your relationship with things like Twitter changes. I, I might be completely transformed by, this, by the interaction, if it's sustaining, if it's creatively rewarding and enriching. My default mode now is to, to try to create an oasis of um, less active storytelling and maybe a, a lower level of interaction that might be advisable by people who know what they're talking about. Um, my idea is, is perhaps a romantic one, um, that if, if the story is compelling enough, people will wait. And the interaction, um, where, whereas it might be limited, might be even more enriching. I remember watching Cormac McCarthy on Oprah 
uh, I was in Johannesburg, and he's one of my literary heroes. And it, it dawned on me when I saw him, I think, Anne-Marie, you sent me a, a DVD, as I recall, because I'm, I'm such a, a Cormac McCarthy fan, is that he was, he, was a, he was an old guy who felt uncomfortable on film, as I do, who licked his lips a lot and, and didn't say much. So I'm not sure how much you can approach the mystery of creation, of creating art by knowing the creator. Uh, I'm willing to, to explore that, but I'm not convinced that you can really get close to that mystery. Laura? I'll counterpoint Ethan and say that Twitter might not exist at the end of your journey, which is fascinating too. I'm Laura Amico, I'm a Neiman Berkman fellow, and I think it's a fascinating journey what you're doing. What fascinates me about it is the tension between living in the moment, as you've described, and the incredible length of time that will pass in the moment. You talked about the end point in your presentation, showed a photo of what that might look like. I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you're thinking about time in regards to this and, and what those moments mean in terms of the entire journey. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And it's one that, um, again, that's one frontier that I hope to plumb. Um, I was talking to Anne-Marie a little bit earlier about what if I'm moving so slowly through a story that the story is actually faster than I am? How does that warp the story? Or is that a warp or is that real? Um, how much does the locomotory limits on my reportage um, make the story um, less compelling or less representative or even less artful. Um, I, I, I'm going to explore those. I, I don't know. I don't know. What I hope, you know, what I hope to uh, do is the same thing that I do when I'm reporting in the moment as a, a conventional foreign correspondent, is that what I, what I have to remind young people who want to get into our field is that, and this is getting, this seems like it's a, it's a, it's a sidetrack, but I don't think it is, is that whether you're moving quickly or slowly through a story, it's, it's how much you withhold as much as how much that you share that defines, um, in my book, the quality of the storytelling. And that's where I come back to this notion of in the moment reportage, you know, it won't be every day. Maybe parts of it will be every day. Some days it'll be five times a day even. If I'm moving through uh, internal events that I'm willing to share or external new breaking news, uh, if I'm walking through a country that suddenly erupts around me, I can see coming out of my slow time, my, my deep travel mode and emerging back onto the surface of the information superhighway or tsunami or whatever metaphor you want to use, surf that for a while. I think it's going to go in and out. You know, I think it will. And I think my tolerance for either one will, 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 will change. I think maybe um, after long periods of quietude where the chronology has, has been very stretched out, doing a lot of in-the-moment reporting that's, that's shared immediately will be a palate cleanser. There have been two references to Ethan Zuckerman, and I think since he's here, I was just going to give him the microphone. And Ethan's gotten to know Paul and this project well um, during Paul's uh, visiting Neiman Fellowship. And I'm wondering, Ethan, if you have a hypothesis about the question you posed to Paul, um, and embedded in that, Laura's point about, you know, who knows what the technology will be in two, three, five, seven, seven years. You know, I, my favorite thing that, that Paul said tonight talking about this is his thinking about how his writing is likely to change and how thinking about the iambic pentameter of walking and the experience of the heartbeat and such that he'll be disappointed if he's not writing in a different way a year, three years, five years into this project. And I think I feel the same way about Paul and how he chose to connect with the rest of the world. So I think right now, this is an experiment in stepping away from news cycles that are 24 hours, four hours, 15 minutes, can I tweet this talk in real time? But I also can imagine that relationship changing in any number of different ways. And I would be very surprised if there aren't uh, ebbs and flows to this. Um, I, I think my comment about thinking that uh, I can imagine Paul getting, getting quite attached to connection um, 
uh, comes from thinking about some of these empty spaces and, and thinking about um, whether you feel the same way five years into a journey walking through the slow out of Vostok and, and wondering at that point whether part of what's interesting is the community of people who are still watching uh, and who are still walking with. So I guess in the same way uh, that, that Paul's hoping for his writing to change, I'm, I'm very interested in how his relationship to an audience changes over time. your project and definitely for a lot of us it uh, just tells us that we should continue to you know shake and get out of our comfort zones you know from a life perspective i'm a journalist from india so if you come by if you need chai you'll definitely get a lot of it uh, but my question is since you're talking about uh, you're tracing back into migration where uh, vast numbers of people just had to leave home with no sight of what home is going to be you are going to come back home and in that sense, how have, I'm sure you would have thought about the ideas of home, longing, family, and you know the very basic human emotions. How do you plan to tackle that? What if you just? I mean, you are definitely going to have the thing. I want to go home, mm. or or you know, or is your family going to come? I mean, after all, this is great, but you are only human, right. and that's obvious. No, that's that's a that's a really, really really good question. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I've been asked, what, what will I miss the most? And of course, it's going to be from family foremost and friends, although they, they will be joining me. Um, you know, I'm married, and, and my wife, who is here, um, will be, who's a visual artist, will be joining me. Um, we've come up with an idea that, that at least I am calling Oases, where she gets to pick a spot where she can do her studio work, and I walk to her. And in that sense, the journey is shared. She has the power to determine the routing. Um, I, I also have to, I guess what it requires a little autobiography is I, I'm fascinated by the notion of home because I've never really known it. I mean, I crossed my first border at age six. I was raised in, in a different culture. Uh, and, you know, the old saying, you never can go home again, made me, I think, a better uh, international reporter. Um, you know, I've been asked, where will I go when it's done? I haven't a clue, because I have never really stopped roaming. Um, really, um, physically, I don't mean just sort of psychologically, uh, since I've been six years old. I mean, I've, I've stayed a few years here, a few years there. So I feel at home in a lot of places. Um, the flip side of that is I don't really belong in a lot of places. Uh, so I don't know how that's going to change. I've never, I've never continuously moved for seven years. Um, I hearken back, though, to some of the reading, um, you know, that maybe inspired subliminally this notion of a long journey, whether it's, you know, Homeric literature or, you know, Melville, where people left a port not too far away from here um, for five years at a time, and it was considered normal. And when they came back, they were not the same person, right? Um, Husbands and wives were separated, and they had their independent lives, and they came back together, and I don't know what happened. You never hear what happened to the guys who retired <laughs> uh, after they came back to New Bedford. But um, this notion of exile, of restlessness, of statelessness has been a lifelong subject of my writing, and this is kind of the culmination of that. Alex? I'm Alex Jones. I'm director of the Shorenstein Center. And when I was in my 20s, I trekked all the way from Tangier to Cape Town. So I have some sense of what you're up to and the great joy of it. But I have a question for you that's a prosaic one, perhaps, but it's important. You talked about the danger of the world, but the real danger to you is going to be sickness. Mm -hmm. You're going to be vulnerable, and you're making yourself vulnerable. And that's the best thing that you can do for connecting with the world that you want to connect with. But that's also going to put you in a situation where you're going to be accepting hospitality. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have to cope with, with the fact that you're going to be in some places in the world where there are dangers to you that are not guns and ammo. Mm -hmm. How are you going to cope with that if it happens? And how are you going to prevent it? Yeah, I think, I think the last word or the last phrase is the key, prevent it. 
Um, it's no good uh, trying to, it's no fun certainly uh, dealing with it once you have an illness. And I'm getting a little long in the tooth to ascribe, as I always have, to Stephen Crane's edict that he used his lab body as a laboratory. <laughs> I've used mine a lot. Uh, I've been sick an awful lot uh, with some pretty serious diseases, tropical diseases. Um, I can't say that um, I have an easy answer for that. I've got a prosaic answers, which is I'll be carrying the highest technology and the most portable technology possible for water filtration. And that's a huge part of the problems is waterborne disease. I think Rajard Kapuscinski was asked, what's the most dangerous thing you've run across in, the, in your travels in the world? And he said, the blade of a knife. And they said, oh, you've been assaulted. He said, no, no, when they cut the mongos um, and lay the blade aside and the, the microbes on the blade that stay there. Um, so I'll be carrying a med kit, a portable one, with a few very key but powerful um, meds uh, that have worked in the past. And I'll, when I have to, I'll rely, and it'll, and it'll have to a lot, rely on um, national uh, medical systems, which I've relied on before. And I find them very adequate, if not more so, because they're designed for the local diseases uh, that occur in these areas. So I've been treated by doctors, by Cuban doctors, by Ugandan doctors, um, by Congolese doctors, who were phenomenal, who had not much more than their hands to work with. I'm not romanticizing that either. I'm just saying there's enough help generally nearby. Unless I, unless I get a severe injury, and then, then that's all bets are off. If I break a bone, I'm out somewhere. That's, that's serious. I have two sat phones. I have insurance that has medevac, whatever that's worth. By the time they get to me from Nairobi, who knows, right? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, thank you very much. And I don't know whether this is pertinent, but I had seen that journey um, on television one time. And the one thing they, they left out was Europe. Um, and it sounds like an anthropological journey, but where does, I mean, where does Europe fit into this? It just seems to be not a part of the picture. Are they just mutants? Or, I mean, how did, how did people in northern, in Europe, where, where do they fit into this picture? Um, well, they, they fit in integrally. I mean, that's the beauty of this, if, if you know, that's the beauty of uh, evolution is that we're so closely related, we're, we're, I think we're on the order of 50 times more closely related than chimpanzees are to each other. We have an enormous, we're, we're basically kissing cousins. Um, so they, they, you know, there was a migration out of Europe. It, it, well, migration's a bad word. I'm always being chastised, and rightfully so, by, by paleoanthropologists that it implies intent. It implies that somebody wanted to go to Europe or Eurasia, and of course they didn't. They were eating their way across the surface of the planet. And, you know, when you exhausted resources, you moved on, or if your population boomed, you moved on. So some people were pushed into what is today Europe. Um, I've been, from the very beginning, lobbied by my wife to, to, to walk through Europe. She will meet me in Paris. Um, <laughs> I've told her they have very good coffee in Turkey um, as well, and it would add another year or two. So I'm, I'm intentionally leaving Europe out, partly because it's also, you know, this is a journalistic decision that is, that is like, is, is value free. It's not, I can't validate it, except a lot has been written about Europe and I'm more interested in sort of undercovered areas, even paleoanthropologically. So I'm headed east instead of west. Yes. Hi, my name is Sandy Close, mm. and I have a question for the National Geographic editor, your editor. Right. Um, we, we sent Shane Bauer to the Middle East several years ago, a man fluent in Arabic, a lover of the street, a walker, and he walked into Iraq and he went to the Kurdish part of Iraq to cover the elections among the Kurds. And of course, he stepped over a line and became a proxy in US-Iranian relations and spent two years in prison. It was frustrating for me. I had no protocols that I could access to uh, try to help him. We essentially used media. Media was very cooperative. 
swarmed to try to support his cause. Many young people like Shane, with languages and with this passion to explore, um, are in similar vulnerable positions. What do we as the publishers, what do we as the supporters, um, as the media outlets who will benefit from this, do to build some sort of international protocols that can come to the help of our great Marco Polos? That is a really, really good question, and I can't answer it in a general way. I can answer it to some degree specifically around what we're doing in support of Paul's project. And we're in the middle now of working up a very clear security protocol for Paul. And in fact, we're going to be having a meeting on Monday at the Geographic uh, to discuss how we're going to cope with the different possible eventualities that he will face. And I know your question is somewhat differently oriented, but that's all I know how to do at this point in relation to Paul. Now, he has partners who have much more experience than we have had, the Pulitzer Center in particular I'm thinking of. And I could actually pass this back to Paul for further insights for you on what we can do in the media uh, to help prevent that kind of thing. Hi, Sandy. C congratulations, by the way, on the award. Um, I would, I'm going to pass the buck to Anne-Marie Lipinski. Um, so I think, Sandy, that in, in my ex experience with this, some of it um, unfortunate experience, and in, particularly, in particular involving Paul at one point, um, a, a lot of these, um, I think it's very difficult to think about developing protocols when um, a lot of the tensions become nation specific and the way that you have to deal and address um, a situation like the one he found himself in in Sudan was, was quite specific to the region. And a whole set of um, uh, political dynamics on the ground, relations between our country and that one, um, what the tensions were on the border Paul had crossed. And I don't know if what we learned in that situation, uh, and it was a lot, how much of that is really applicable to the next, um, you know, to the next reporter's crisis? And you've seen a lot of them, as you uh, mentioned, um, over the years. I will say, um, it takes a village <laughs> uh, when it does happen. Um, you know, the New York Times famously had a case within the last couple of years, and when you read the after stories about the coordination that was required um, to address. The crisis. Uh, one of the things you discover is um, you're reinventing it every time. Um, that there are some basic principles, but it does go to um, you have to address unique political situations often uh, on the ground and relationships um, that you can form in these regions uh, that are very, very geographically specific um, often. We're uh, running out of time, but Paul, I wanted to ask you um, two things to close, sort of back to the back to journalism. Um, and uh, one is, um, you have talked about this project being something of an antidote, or your hope that it becomes something of an antidote to this diminution of foreign reporting um, in this country. And one of the things I was thinking about um, was the economics of this project. And if you prorate the costs of this over a seven year horizon and everything that will come out of it, um, it's <laughs> not that expensive. Mm -hmm. And um, I've been really kind of I've sort of marveled at how inexpensive, really high quality journalism mm -hmm. can sometimes be. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, you know, what is your, um, I know you have a lot of goals for this project, I know some of them are go to the higher capital J journalism and you know mm -hmm. what kind of institutional changes might come out of this. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense of that going in that you are um, you know, one man 
trying to make some valiant effort to the return of this kind of reporting. And mm -hmm. that just, I'm addressing one issue, which is the economics of it. Mm -hmm. And I know that's frustrated a lot of newsrooms. But I'm wondering if there's a broader question that is that goes to American appetite uh, for these stories. So there are two things there. And um, I'm wondering which you think has been more, um, to which can we attribute the decline? And do you think a project like this has some hope of um, reinstituting a passion for it? Yeah, I, mu I must admit, in all honesty, I, I, I don't think of the project in those terms. I, it's much more personal. And I, I don't, I've never really thought of it as a, as a, as a, um, a life ring uh, for um, foreign correspondents, American foreign correspondents, or as an example to follow. Certainly, I don't think too many people will follow my model. Um, it's also very cheap what I'm doing because I'm, in, I'm very cheap. I'm a cheap date. Um, <laughs> but it, it, you know, your point is a serious one. I, I think it's more, it's not so much, hmm, can, I, can I build a, uh, a model that will demonstrate um, the value of foreign correspondence on an economic uh, level, because I just can't. I don't even think in those terms. But I, I'm more uh, selfish in the sense that I, I, I just love what I do. And I've, I've come up with an idea that allows me to do what I, what I love to do for a very long time, hopefully. And if the quality is an attractant, whatever that quality may be, um, that is a wonderful spin-off that argues for um, people uh, getting the appetite back for global news. Because whether you're a citizen journalist or an indigenous journalist or uh, work for a, uh, a big media company, we're all, whether we, whether, we, whether we squabble over it or not, we're all in the same boat of getting the story told. Um, and unless we can get people's attention um, to, to show them these hidden connections um, of how what happens in the, the Niger Delta of Congo when somebody uh, accidentally blows up an oil pipeline um, and not just evoke, as we always have tried to, the empathy for those people, but show how it directly impacts the lives of people who buy 20 bucks of gas in Cambridge, um, we have a very difficult, stand a very difficult chance of, of making our case that global reportage is pertinent to people's lives. My long wave experiment, I mean, that's in there, but it's, it's not, it is with some intention, but not, it's gotta be, it's probably second or third tier. I wanna go out and play with language, play with um, reportage, in a, hopefully in a literary way. Um, and when I mentioned to, to get people's attention span, it's for storytelling now. My stage is global, but if I had never left the U.S., um, I might be walking around the perimeter of the U.S. Um, I'm not sure that answers your question. Yeah. I have one more, and that yeah. is um, just going back to the, harkening back to the end of your uh, presentation and the photograph of the man, the nomad who took your photo while you were taking his photo. And um, you asked a really big question, which is, um, who gets to tell mm -hmm. the story? Mm -hmm. um, What's your what's your guess about that as you I, head out? I think I'm, I'm really excited about this because I'm going to tell my story the way I see it. But I would love for I would love to be a flint striking against stone, other other hard stones that spark other people's narratives. I would love it. I would never be more happy than for people to riff off the walk and head out in their own direction narratively. Um, that to me would be a huge metric for success. And that means um, if there's a social media element, we've been talking about handing the mic, as it were, off to people that I meet along the trail and have them describe their lives as opposed to me describe it or have us both do it and see how my boots on the ground experience as gritty and granular as it may be and as, as trained as an observer as I might be in the conventional sense, how far off the mark I still am from what other people perceive to be the important things in their life. And one of the cool measures of doing this, this, this does allude to your question, and again, I'm talking to my friends at, at, at the, 
the Center for Geographic Analysis, is I may not be Twittering much, certainly not at the beginning, but devising a mechanism by which we harvest a Twitter feed um, and for 100 kilometers or so around my last geocoded point, my 100 mile markers, to see what the digital conversation is in, that, in Port Sudan or in Aqaba, Jordan. And I don't know it. That's what's cool, is that people might be talking about hyper-local things or global things, and I'm writing about a conventional narrative as a travelogue moving slowly, my slow journalism, and that tension between what the digital world is talking about and what I'm seeing and reporting on is going to be very interesting, both the disconnect and the overlap. And that's also a record that's preserved over seven years. We preserve a seven-year human conversation across the world, just as we preserve seven years of 30-second ambient sound measures taken, um, interviews across the world, videos, etc. Godspeed, my friend. Thank you.